The Business of Esports podcast is brought to you by G Fuel, the official energy drink of esports and the original energy formula of gaming. Visit them online at gfuel.com. Welcome to the Business of Esports podcast, where we explore the intersection of business and esports, the fastest growing entertainment phenomenon of this generation. Please welcome your hosts, Arda Okal, William Collis, and Paul Dalalibi. The Business of Esports podcast begins now. From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the Business of Esports podcast with Paul Dawalibi, William Collis, and I'm your host, Arda Okal. Uh, we bring you this podcast every single Thursday, wherever you get your podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe when you leave a five-star rating and a favorable review. It helps others find the podcast and also makes us feel good. So thank you very much for doing that. Lots to get to on this episode. So gentlemen, I say let's jump right into it. Uh, the first thing I want to mention, actually, uh, this past weekend... Uh, had a chance to uh, be involved with Gamers for Giving, great charity. Uh, they put these things called go-karts, basically a video game system on wheels uh, in children's hospitals so that children can play them uh, as they uh, go through their battles. Uh, each one costs around 3500 bucks, and I think they raised uh, over $500,000 from the weekend alone. Wow. Tons of streamers there, uh, lots of uh, casters were there, uh, and I was involved there too. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Zach Weigel and the whole team uh, because it was a really cool event. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, let's get started. Uh, this is a story that we missed last week, gentlemen. Call of Duty, uh, the franchise tag has been set for the Call of Duty League. It'll be $25 million. This was first broke by ESPN. The possible launch for the league is 2020. Uh, this is via Engadget. Buyers are asked to indicate their interest within the next 14 days if they want to enter a non-binding deal. While no millions will change hands just yet, interested Overwatch League team owners will reportedly have the first right of negotiation for their respective home markets. William, I'll start with you on this one. What do you think of the $25 million price tag specifically for a Call of Duty franchise? You know, I, this, is, this is such an interesting question because on the one hand, I think it's great, right? Like this is another major league that's charging a big ticket price to get it on the ground floor. At the same time, you're a bit surprised. I'm actually a bit surprised it's not higher, right? Like I thought the whole thing about the Overwatch League going out at $20 million, was it was in, in its first year was it was speculative people didn't know how esports leagues would operate people didn't know what the return you know how 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 great it was going to be to be a part of it um you would think if the overwatch league was working incredibly well that this would be a hundred million right like you would think because this is in some sense saying okay like it's it's revealing of the value of a franchise spot for a blizzard game basically it is sort of what i say um, and I, I'm surprised. I think it comes down to I think they're going to have trouble finding buyers at 25 million. Blunt, I, don't, I think they're going to have trouble finding buyers at a higher value. I think they're going to have trouble finding buyers at 25 million. I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the final ticket price is. I also think if you're an Overwatch League team owner, how does this make you feel? You just in some instances, you just ponied up 50 million dollars to buy in in this last stage. And now all of a sudden you're being hit up again for another check for 25 million for a very similar type of game that arguably addresses a similar audience from the same publisher. I, I think it's very bold. I imagine this Call of Duty League is very carefully crafted behind the scenes to be differentiated from Overwatch. At least I hope that's the case. I expect we see the Call of Duty World League or whatever they're going to call the, the new one, the World League's their prior one. Um, being more set around a battle royale style play, my strong prediction, brace yourself, um, to differentiate it um, and levering up, leveraging the blackout mode from this year's Call of Duty Black Ops 4. But we'll see. What do you think, Paul? I'm a bit confused here, William. You're saying you're surprised it's not higher, but, but you're also saying at this price, you think no one's going to bite or they're going to have trouble selling it. Yeah, I, I guess. Let me, let me rephrase it so it's clear. I think it it is highlighting, I think, the general tepid performance of the Overwatch League that this slot is not a bigger deal. Like, you would think if the Overwatch League was the bang-out success that it's made out to be, that this slot would be coming in at $100 million, right? Significantly above where Overwatch League slots launched at, because the idea is you've, the value of being in a league with Blizzard Entertainment has been proved out. But that is not the case, right? This is coming in at the exact same price of OWL, essentially, which to me sort of speaks a little bit to maybe the tepidness of the, of the of Overwatch League performance. I don't know. It could also mean that 
they just think this is, they're trying to make this an easy upsell for existing teams. I mean, I've spoken to a few owners of Overwatch League teams. They've all been pitched this, obviously. None of them that I've spoken to have jumped on it. They're all still doing their diligence. So like no one has said, oh my God, this is a slam dunk. We have to do this right and wrote the check sort of the first day. But I know they're all looking at it and and maybe Blizzard priced it. So as without, I'm, I think I'm going on the assumption that this was priced based on more of a, how high can we charge? How much can we charge without people doing too much work and too much due diligence here? And, and sort of say, well, we're already invested with them for, you know, to the tune of 20 million or 30 million or 40 million or whatever the number is they bought in as an Overwatch League team. What's another 25? It's like, it's like the, the, the gum at the, at the checkout counter. Sure. Isn't right? it interesting like you, though 20, that like $25 that $25 million dollar gum. <laughs> yeah. $25 million dollar gum. Isn't this interesting though, that like with all the investors and all the money coming into esports that you guys are talking about this investment like it's an upsell for an existing franchisee as opposed to attracting new franchisees. And it even in the story, it says the Overwatch League team owners have first right of refusal. It's totally an upsell, right? Because they, they've already sold to these guys a vision. And and my my guess is what they did was they took the Overwatch League business plan. They did a search and replace for Overwatch and, and added in Call of Duty <laughs> and then just handed back the same business plan. Like the, other than the game they're playing, it seems like the the concept is exactly the same. And to Overwatch League's credit, and I've said this many times before, its success, my belief, is not due to the game. The success is due to the structure. It was familiar for advertisers. The regularity of the games makes it easy for a viewer. You know, I think Overwatch League has succeeded, and I, I'm doing air quotes here, in spite of the game being pretty in a pretty bad place right now. Um, and I have a funny feeling they're banking on the same kind of thing with Call of Duty. The game is not in a great place, does not have a, a crazy player base that's just super excited about the current game, but they're banking on the fact that if they bring this to cities, and that city concept is very powerful, it, it's very primal, it's, it's tribal, right? We want to belong to something. We, wanna, we feel like we win if our city wins. They're banking on that, for this to succeed and therefore are charging a very high price. I think a crazy price given where the call of duty game is at and, and call of duty esports are at generally, but they're betting on their structure to carry this the same way overwatch league structure carried a lackluster game. You know, here's my interesting question on all this. I want to put a different lens on it, which is what does it mean for the existing competitive Call of Duty teams, right? Because first of all, like there are organizations who've been playing this game for many, many years who build, build, built deep commitments to the space. It's sort of saying on Blizzard's part, first of all, we don't really care about the current teams who are in here. Our priority is shoring up the Overwatch League and keeping those relationships strong, right? And in particular, it's potentially saying, and we don't care if we bring a bunch of non-endemic orgs into the space, because the, remember, the vast majority of Overwatch League team owners don't operate a Call of Duty team. They don't even offer an e operate an esports team outside of Overwatch. So it's a bit weird to go to say, you know, the the um, the Boston Uprising and say, hey guys, we know you've never competed in Call of Duty before, but here's your first pick for the Call of Duty Boston. Spot. I don't think that's I don't I don't think that's strange at all. To me that's the most obvious sale, William, in the sense that I'm I'm the owner of the Boston Uprising, right? I just I just sank 20 million bucks into this franchise plus God knows how many more millions for players and you know the facilities and training and staff and infrastructure, right? So it's a hefty investment. And and all of this is riding on one game, on the success of Overwatch. If I'm Blizzard and I'm the sales team at Blizzard, I'm going to Boston Uprising and I'm telling them, look, we're such nice guys. We're going to give you the opportunity to diversify the games you're, you're, you're enrolled in here, you're participating in here. You can leverage all of your existing infrastructure. So all the staff and stuff you have managing your Overwatch League team, there's crossover here with the Call of Duty team and all for the low, low price of 25 million. <laughs> right? This okay. is a huge like... It's a it's such an it's such an easy upsell for for Blizzard to go back and say, look, you've already have this huge sunk cost and it's incredibly risky because it's all on one game. So we're going to give you a nice little out with a second game and you can leverage all of your existing infrastructure. 
it, it's just I, I I definitely take the point. But let me. It's interesting to me. First of all, they pick such a similar game, and I get why they would do it for infrastructure leveraging points. But it is a bit weird to me because you have to imagine that there's cannibalization between the two games, right? That a fans of Overwatch are also fans of Call of Duty because they're both marquee first person shooters. And so it's not such a big audience expansion play as it could be. Right. So that, But I also sort of wonder whether these two leagues will run concurrently, right? Like maybe maybe the Call of Duty League will run when Overwatch is not. Oh, well, I would hope so. Season, you would yeah, hope so. In the off in the but Overwatch off season. That actually is an interesting point, Arda. That makes a lot more sense to me. I don't know why I hadn't thought of that. You're right. That this is essentially pitching, hey guys you put all this money in for four months of content. Now here's eight, right? Yeah. Just just pay 25 million and double your double your schedule. Well, look, um, I, I think Blizzard is brilliant here. Like the, the milking of dollars that they're doing right now from from big investors is and sponsors is borderline genius. I I think 80 percent of the guys involved in 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 these Blizzard esports buying teams at these crazy dollars are going to lose their shirts. But you have to hand it to Blizzard. The structure they've put in place, the sales pitch they've put in place, not only is it resonating, but it's clearly working. Well, this goes back to what I think I've said in every podcast, which is I think the Overwatch League from a business perspective is incredibly well mm -hmm. run, right? Like from a business perspective, it's unbeatable in terms of how it is set up to um, engage, to build stability, and to, in general, yeah, maximize revenue. And I mean... Credit to it, I was doing a bit of back of the envelope math. Overwatch League has 150 million in annual sponsorships split across, I think it's 16 teams, right, Arda? Do Very I have that impressive. number right? Very impressive. Yeah. I think it's more I mean, than more, 20, 20 teams. 20 teams. 20, 20 teams now. 20 teams, or 20 teams. That's like $8 million a year in sponsorship per team. Now, we don't know the exact splits, but you know, it, it does sort of put the context of the the league pricing um uh it puts it in context if you imagine, okay, you can be you can relying on a four million dollar annuity payment effectively. Mm -hmm. Um, if you assume it's half half between teams and publisher, and I think it's probably a little bit more to the publisher, but um, you know, twenty five million for a four million dollar annuity, not such a bad deal. Well, so it, it is back of the envelope, if if you spent forty million on the team, you're talking like eight, nine years to to pay back your investment. Yeah, if the, if you assume there's zero upside. Right. As my point, like I granted a, a nine year payback is not so hot by itself, but well, you have to assume year, the game survives and the league yeah. survives eight, nine years. And that's that's something in esports that we never know. We never know. Yeah. So. Just uh, League of Legends. Yeah. Just League of Legends or maybe Dota 2 too as well. Uh, all right. If, if, if there's anything that we haven't talked about, by the way, on this podcast, you can yell at us on Twitter at Biz Esports on Instagram as well at Biz Esports and the business of esports .com, where every single day you will have links to keep yourself updated on the business of esports. Many of those topics we talk about here on the podcast. How about this one? Speaking of sponsorship, BMW drives into esports. Wrote that one myself with their first <laughs> sponsorship with Cloud9. The partnership will include BMW commercials. Uh, this is days after Cloud9 announced a partnership with AT&T. Uh, now, we have seen many car companies, including Mercedes-Benz, Kia, and other car companies already involved in the esports space. My question to both of you, uh, this is a rather quick topic here, but what I am curious about regarding BMW and esports is... This is a more affluent brand that's making a splash now to esports. Not the first, I mentioned Mercedes-Benz, but BMW getting into this space. Does this speak to the affluence of, e of the esports audience, or is this a keeping up with the Joneses situation where other car companies are in the space already and BMW feels they have to catch up? Paul? You know, I think the whole car company sponsoring esports thing is, is a phenomenon unto itself in that I can't think of, I don't think there's a single car company other than maybe the super high end like Ferrari, Lamborghini. I don't think there's a single car company today not engaged in esports in some way. Like more so than any other industry, it seems the automotive industry has embraced esports. My, my view there, my assumption there is they're doing it because they're worried about Uber and that there's an entire generation of kids who will grow up and not even have a driver's license and would rather take an Uber than buy a car. And they see esports as the way to reach this younger audience and this first time car buyer audience. And this is why they're all there. I'm assuming it's for those kinds of smart reasons that literally every single car company on the planet is participating in esports. But BMW and Mercedes, I think, are interesting ones because it, it speaks to an affluence in the esports viewer demographic 
that I don't think anyone really talks about. So my assumption is BMW has done the math here, has done their homework here, and realizes that there are enough potential BMW car buyers, and that's a premium vehicle at a premium price. Um, there are enough BMW car buyers within the esports viewing audience that this is worth their while. And it's not just a, well, Honda's doing it or Toyota's doing it, so I have to do it too. I'm guessing here they've done their research. And and I think that bodes well for esports in general if if this kind of research that they've done pans out to be true. If it turns out to be true that the that this demographic is is more affluent than the average, I think it opens up the universe to a whole host of other sponsors. William, your thoughts? Yeah, I think first of all, it's interesting. The only car company who basically hasn't done anything um, with esports teams is Tesla, which to me feels like one of the most natural fits, actually, which is it's kind of a funny aside. But yeah, there's definitely something going on here with average age of car buyer, average age of esports fan. The average age of a car buyer is 55 right now in America. Um, that is crazy, right? That essentially is exactly what Paul was suggesting, that young people are substituting away to public transport, ride sharing apps, et cetera. Um, in contrast, the average age of an esports viewer is 33, if you believe the higher end estimates. This is clearly all about reaching a young demographic. Now, I'm surprised that a premium car company like BMW is making the push in here. You would think that they would be more targeted at second or third time or, you know, slightly older, slightly wealthier car buyers. But I think it really highlights the fundamental challenge facing the automotive industry, which is they are being, you know, they're being replaced by the youth in the sharing economy. And I think this is a instant accessible way to get street credit with the young lads who like that darn video game box. Um, so I, I think it's that pure and simple. It's why every car company's done it. It's why I imagine we will see more from car companies going forward. And I think it speaks more to the challenges in the car industry than it does to any strength in esports. Although obviously esports has commanding viewership numbers that makes this appealing. All right, we're going to move on to our next topic here. EA has been in the news recently due to the success of Apex Legends. This news, not so good. Uh, they're laying off around 350 people, uh, according to Variety. Uh, this is from a workforce of about 9,000. This is the statement from EA in the Variety article. We've made changes to our marketing and publishing organization, our operations teams, and we are ramping down our current presence in Japan and Russia as we focus on different ways to serve our players in those markets. In addition to organizational changes, we are deeply focused on increasing quality of our games and services. Via Kotaku, in an email to employees obtained by Kotaku, uh, EA marketing boss Chris Bruzo said the goal would be to consolidate uh, the three departments, improve the publisher's customer support, and change some of its international strategies. Um, uh, like we said, a move that includes closing offices in Russia and Japan. So uh, this is normal, of course. Uh, th this does happen in large companies like EA. Uh, this is not, you know, it's certainly bad news for people losing their jobs. Uh, but this kind of news does happen in large companies like this. What is interesting is the timing given uh, the success of Apex Legends and how much of a presumed financial success that that game is, Paul. I wouldn't read too much into this. I really wouldn't. I mean, it's a, a relative, it's still a lot of people. It's a lot of human beings with families and things like that. And so it's never good news, but it's a relatively small number of people compared to the size of EA. I think the interesting conversation for me here is, you know, Japan has been a, a laggard in terms of esports and, and having an esports infrastructure. And there's been a lot of people recently talking about Japan seeing a resurgence or, or esports taking off there and, and people making an effort to go and launch esports in Japan because the market is a valuable one and, and there's a lot of opportunity there and they are far behind relative to the rest of Asia and relative to the West. And, and I'm curious if this sets things back, right? Like is EA abandoning Japan because they realize, well, this is never going to happen or not happen anytime soon. And so we don't need to put any resources here. Right. I should I should I should add William before I, I said to consolidate those three those departments uh, which departments Chris Bruzo was talking about was operations organization and publishing I just want to make that note Will got it um yeah I, I think I think Paul's exactly right here we're totally you know in line I mean he has ten thousand employees this is what equivalent to laying off you know three percent of their workforce it's 
it happens all the time. It's more of a restructuring. I think the interesting thing hidden here is is in Paul's comment, which has to do with Japan and esports. And this is an area where I know a fair bit. For those of you who don't know, my wife is Japanese. I speak okay Japanese. I've lived over there a fair bit. I'm very interested in the gaming space in Japan as well. Um, and Japan is just woefully, woefully behind for esports. The the structure of society there, largely driven by the commuter lifestyle. Um, has really driven mobile games and cell phone games much more into the mainstream. It's why every major Nintendo platform is so focused on portability, even the Switch. It, it really reflects, I think, sort of the Japanese aesthetic towards more of a, a um, an anywhere type of play, which is relatively antithetical to esports because, as we've talked about, or Paul has said so much in the past, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he is not a fan of games you can play on your phone. And more to the point, they're intense experiences. They're designed for you to have a proper setup with fancy equipment and go all in, not to be doing playing a game of League of Legends in your five minutes between subway stops. So I, I do think this is the reality, which is just Japan just seems unable or unwilling as a consumer base to get behind esports. Um and I think, you know, EA granted is a lot more than just esports. They have a lot of traditional publishing um, businesses, including Mirror's Edge and Dice, uh, my favorite studio and games that those guys do. Um, but it's also highlighting the fact that those traditional types of games are fading out versus either the extremely lucrative mobile titles or the sort of longevity sponsorship um, broad based opportunity of esports, which extends beyond just an individual package good sale. So I, I, I think this is really highlighting the uniqueness of the Japanese market. And it'll be interesting to see how Western publishers choose to address it or if they choose to try to address it at all. It certainly seems like we just talked about the Overwatch League and Call of Duty League. Nobody's talking about buying the Tokyo franchise slot there for a reason. Well, we're going to get to the other news regarding the Overwatch League being on ABC in a little bit. But William, uh, I want to start with you on this piece of news. This is probably the biggest gaming news of the week. Very similar to what we talked about on our last episode, which you can find on the archives. Another major company making a splash into the gaming space. William, I know you are super excited. Actually, both of you extremely excited about this. Apple has announced Apple Arcade. This is from The Verge. Apple is unveiling a new Apple Arcade game subscription service today at the company's Showtime event. Unlike cloud gaming services from competitors like Sony, Microsoft, Google, and NVIDIA, Apple's gaming subscription isn't designed to stream games to iOS devices. Instead, it's a subscription game service for titles that can be installed from the App Store. We don't have a current price point. Uh, the Timeline is reportedly the fall. This was one announcement of many uh, from Apple, including Apple TV Plus and Apple MasterCard, et cetera, et cetera. You can find the whole presentation online. Now, more than 1 billion people have downloaded games from the App Store, and there are more than 300,000 games available already. These games won't be available on any other mobile platform or any subscription service other than Apple Arcade. Games will be downloaded and played straight from the App Store, and subscribers will be able to try games whenever they want and resume them across devices. All of the game features, content, and future updates will be included, and there will be no ads shown within the games. Um, interested, interesting titles on launch. The Lego series involved. We saw that logo. SimCity creator Will Wright will be creating a game as well. Uh, but, William, I can already hear you huffing and puffing on the phone, uh, so have at it, man. What did you think of this announcement? Yeah, can we edit in a sad trombone sound? <laughs> I mean, this is like, okay. for, first of all, two things. I mean, talk about rushed out as a response to Google streaming to indicate that they have some sort of streaming play themselves. I mean, just the lack of details in this announcement kind of smacks to me of quickly getting something out there to show that Apple's not behind. But second of all, I mean, who cares? <laughs> like, just, just honestly, who cares? Like, the apps that you could buy for 99 cents in the Apple App Store anyway are now available for a subscription service, which, by the way, says nothing about the microtransaction models, which fundamentally support these types of games and experiences, right? Like that is the fundamental mobile model. It's not even clear to me what subscription means in that context, and I doubt it's clear to Apple. Um, and I'm just reminded of this sounds suspiciously like, do you remember the OIA, the OIA launch? I remember that mm. high powered home console with tons of custom built apps, free to try, low price subscription, absolute dumpster fire. I mean, this exactly smacks to me of what happens when you try to build a rush service around a network of bad games fund or of uninteresting games. Fundamentally, 
people have to play the games. And unless Apple is going to announce with this, you know, a hundred million dollar initiative into new engrossing mobile development and mobile interactive control methods and all sorts of other things, this is just a quick you check the box, try to ameliorate the shareholders that we, yes, we have a response to subscription gaming in Google. You know, I, I thought, I'm sure everyone listening, if they've listened to any of the previous podcasts, everyone listening is going to go, wow, Paul's just going to agree with William here. He's going to call mobile gaming hot garbage and, and we're going to move on and that'll be the end of this topic. The reality is I actually disagree with you, William, fundamentally on the conclusion here. So let, let me just explain. Okay? I, I'm bated breath. Here we go. <laughs> First of all, let, let me just preface this by saying so I don't lose any, any PC Master Race cred here. Um, these are probably the two worst weeks of my life, having to listen to people get on stage and call things the future of gaming or gaming reimagined and then pull out some some garbage streaming thing or some garbage mobile thing. Like just having to listen to this, if I was already on the edge last week, this definitely put me over the edge. But where I respect this and I don't respect Google's initiative is Apple is not trying to be something they're not. In other words, Google is trying to sell a lie. They're trying to sell um, a streaming service under the guise that it performs as well as a super duper gaming PC and it's going to be the same exact experience and you're never going to need a PC or console again and this is the future of gaming. And to me, this is the Google playbook because they sell a lie with YouTube, they're selling a lie with Stadia. With Apple, I think they're just embracing who they are. They sell mobile devices. That's pretty much all they sell. They're if we're being honest with each other, Apple is the iPhone company. It's not anything. Everything else is a footnote in their accounting. And, and, and this is not a streaming service. They're not reinventing gaming. They're literally just giving you a prepackaged bundle of mobile games for a set price every month. It's a subscription. And it's hard to hate them for it in the sense that you get to pay one monthly price. There's no like in-app transactions. And I respect them for that because the in-app transactions are, are a terrible path in, in gaming. It's a terrible development that has happened in recent years. And so I kind of like what they're doing here. Would I ever buy it myself or subscribe to it myself? No, because mobile games, even fancy ones like they showed on, on the launch, they're still mobile games and they're still garbage. But I see... And I appreciate what they're trying to do. And at least they're not lying to you. At least they're honest with who they are. And they're honest with the consumer about who they are. We're a mobile gaming company. We're giving you a bundle of mobile games at a set price. See, I, I'm just so surprised to hear that from you, Paul. Because at least with the Google announcement, and I, I, I didn't, I, I was actually not as maybe positive on Google Stadia as I should have been last week. I, I respect so much what Google is trying to do. And I get that the dismal reality may fall far from the grand vision, but at least they have a grand vision. And at least if Stadia worked the way they promised it would work, it would change gaming. And at least that's what they're trying to do. You know, again, I don't think it's going to get there. I think the dismal, the, the sad reality is that we're going to be stuck with a halfway product that caters to very few people. But at least they are reaching for real change. They're not. They're not, Will. They're, they're right. selling a lie and they know it. There's, there's brilliant technology people at Google that know you cannot get around the laws of physics. They know. Look, there's guys who tried it hands-on, measured the lag, the input lag at 160 plus milliseconds. Tested, right? The, the, they were testing the product. How, how can you be a self-respecting Google engineer, look at that and go, this is okay, Let's sell this and tell people it's the same experience. They're selling a lie and they know it and I don't respect them for it. They're, they're trying to cram a lie down the consumer's throat. See, I, I just come down the other way, which is to me, Apple's announcement as, you know, your, your defense of Apple is essentially, well, normally we sell hot garbage, but let's be honest about it and sell you a special bundle of hot garbage. Yeah, you yeah, know? exactly. Like, I, I, <laughs> yeah, they've bundled I, hot garbage and made it easy to buy 
and and if you're a if you're a buyer of hot garbage to begin with, well, now you've got a convenient way to get your garbage. One, one stop dumpster. <laughs> yeah. No, I just I, I think it got, look, I, I I have to push back. I know we're going back to Google Mission, but I have to push back because yes, yes, I get that the Google piece is is over marketed. I a hundred percent get that, but. Play devil's advocate here. Couldn't you imagine certain types of games like strategy games working with 160 millisecond lag? Couldn't you imagine certain types of map elements and gameplay elements like heavily destructible terrain in space, for example, where there might be a low gravity, low, low gravity lag anyway that takes advantage of vast distributed computational power? Like I can at least see tendrils of excitement in I, the I, Google. I agree with you. Well, I agree with you. There are games yeah. that it will work for. Here's the problem. Here's the problem for Google. Those games, chances are they'll run just as well on a on an iPad or an iPhone, frankly, right? If the if the input lag is not the issue and that means the game's not that competitive, it's more single player or casual focused, it'll probably run great on an iPad or an iPhone. And and if anything, Apple allows you to play it offline, right? You you can play that same game offline. You don't need to have an internet connection. You can play it on the subway. And you'll be fine. And 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 if anything, that makes the Apple offering that much more compelling. So if Stadia is only good for for really really watered down games or single player games that are that are good um, or casual games that are good, well, they're going to be just as good on an iPhone or an iPad. And I'd rather have it on my device, playable at any time, anywhere, without a connection. Yeah, I, I think I, that's going to be the gonna... big thing in the next few years is 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 can latency be fixed? And if so, then Google was definitely ahead of the curve. Well, but but Paul's right. Latency can't be fixed, at least not without something like quantum entanglement, which is just so far out there. I feel ridiculous saying even those were even saying those words. Right. Like there's fundamental laws of physics. Light only moves so fast, no matter how good the fiber optic cable you lay is, you know, you still have to solve a problem, which is your inputs have to go someplace else, be processed and sent back, right? Um, you can't change that unless- But we also, to- I know that we're the business of esports, right? So in the lens of esports, maybe Stadia is never going to be anything esports, but it's still going to be very successful because maybe the 80% of the gaming audience that will play those games will not care about latency issues. I think that's bold. I think if you play something with above 60 millisecond, you notice it. You, you just you, you will know it will feel sluggish. It will feel you might not know the words to describe it, but the game will feel sticky to you or it will feel molassesy, or it will feel slow or unresponsive. You might not be able to Im- like pinpoint it to, to, to the latency that's being driven through the service. But I, I think fundamentally, even casual gamers would notice. I, I guess it comes down to like I just. I respect reach and I respect ambition and Google service, even if it falls short in the, in, in reality has reach and ambition. Apple service is, you know, here's an even more efficient dumpster delivery mechanism. Here's a question for you. Does this, <laughs> d- does this signify the death now for brick and mortar game stores? I asked this because here's a, here's a, a tweet online from at Wario 64 who said, uh, GameStop stores got a memo saying Sony will no longer provide full game digital download copies to retailers, uh, not just GameStop starting April 1st. Digital games will only be available straight from PSN after that date. Add-on content PSN uh, dollar cards will still be available. Now, that's not a giant piece of news, but what I feel might happen in the next couple of years is we will slowly and surely see this type of news trickle down every couple months where something else is being taken away and the idea of physical copies or something physical though people always like to collect it just might not be as important anymore and we I, I, and and and, 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 and brick and mortar will go away this is totally different yeah. this is totally different right gamestop has been dead for years now it's still it's still around <laughs> they tried finding a buyer they couldn't I, I, we are we're not days away but this company's going bankrupt there's it's guaranteed that they, they will not survive and it's it's the it's the blockbuster of our of the current generation. Okay. Okay. The the reality is though, digital game distribution, which people used to call streaming, um, has been around for a long time, a long time, relatively speaking. And it's not new. It, it didn't, you know, it disrupted physical game stores, so they were no longer relevant. But it's not new. It's it's really a completely different animal. Digital game distribution. 
is already a thing. It's already well accepted. I don't think anyone pushes back and says this has made gaming worse in some way. Here's my last question on this. Uh, do you think that all of these announcements, particularly in the last couple of weeks, are we heading into a renaissance, uh, a golden period for video games, for gaming, for even for esports? Or are we heading to another crash like a 1983? And I say that because the genesis, the, really the, the big thing that led to the crash in the 80s was an oversaturation of video games that were not fun to play, highlighted by E.T., right? But even though E.T. is pointed at as the reason the crash happened, the wheels were in motion many months before that. It was because there were so many video games that were just not fun. And a part of me, especially listening to you guys talk about this, leads me to believe that all of these services are going to lead to a lot of games that will not be fun to play. So now I'm wondering what this will mean to the industry as a whole as we move forward. There's, there's a, it's an interesting question, Arda, but there's a deeper question though, which is from a business standpoint, are we in a bubble in esports, or like, are we headed, is this just a boom period and, and it's going to be up and to the right for the foreseeable future, or is this an artificial bubble that's going to pop at some point? I think that's the, at least for, I think our listeners, that's the more interesting question. The games, I mean, what's good and what's a good game and a bad game is so subjective. It, I think it's hard for us to have that discussion. I definitely think the current trends, instead of creating backlash, it's just, we're just going to get generations of gamers who are more tolerant of garbage, whether that's lag, whether that's mobile, whether that's, uh, you know, slot machine style gaming. I think you're just going to get a generation that's all they know. And so they're much more tolerant. See, I, I feel like it's the opposite. I feel like games education has to start somewhere. Like, let's be very honest. The marquee games for the 1980s, while, yes, there are occasionally truly brilliant titles like Super Metroid, right? The vast majority of those games are pretty bad. Pretty bad. Even the ones that I think would be considered quote unquote classic, like a Castlevania by, by, you know, the, the, uh, the stature of its time it, that would not modern game design and modern game design principles would rip that game to shreds. Right. But the point is you have to start somewhere. You have to start learning about what games are, how they operate, discovering things like progression systems, building basic familiarity with how to input commands. Like it's an educational structure, just like with reading books, you don't start with portrait of the artist as a young man you start with Dr. Seuss, right? Games, they're sort of a similar ramp. And I, I think it's okay that at the top of the funnel, there's a load of quote unquote garbage games, even though I, you know, I'm deeply critical of them and don't enjoy them myself, because at least those games are teaching people about gaming, that interactive mediums can be fun, that they can be easy to play, that it's easy just tap here to harvest your wheat. Come on, it's not that difficult, you idiot. $5 for more wheat, you know, at least that is a teaser digital experience and people can begin to expect and say, I like this, but, I wish there was more here. I wish there was more strategy. I wish there were more options. And the consumer will educate themselves towards better games. And I, I, I'm hopeful that's what's going to happen in our space. It's not that people will just be accepting of Candy Crush is all there is to be all the end all, but they will play Candy Crush, want more than Candy Crush, and begin on a journey towards you know, what I think are truly meaningful interactive entertainment experiences. All right, that's going to wrap things up for this podcast. We actually had a guest this week, uh, a claimed professor at MIT, T.L. Taylor. Uh, she will join us for our last topic on the podcast, actually, which is Overwatch on ABC. We're going to dive into that. She's written multiple books on the esports and streaming space, so this was a very pertinent topic to get her thoughts on. So if you want to hear that, that's going to be a separate podcast and including a full interview with TL on her career and her books. Very informative. I definitely recommend that you check it out. You can find it on our timeline, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Look for the business of esports. And please rate, review, and subscribe when you leave a five-star rating and a favorable review. It helps us and others uh, as well find the podcast. For William Collis and Paul Dawalibi, my name is Ardo Ocal, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the Business of Esports podcast. Check us out at thebusinessofesports.com and on Twitter at bizesports.